Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, both to our audience here in person and also to our audience joining us online. It's good to have everybody here. Um, welcome to today's Lawrence and Center event. My name is Michael Chan and I am Vice President for Mission and Inclusion here at Concordia College. Uh, overseeing the Lawrence and Center here is one of my most cherished responsibilities. Uh, the Center itself uh, honors uh, the life, work, and legacy of Norman M. Lawrence and renowned philanthropist, former CEO of Burlington Northern, alumnus of Concordia College, and former member and chair of its Board of Regents. So, John, this is interesting, right, because part of your research has to do with transportation. And so there's a, a strong, and even railroads, as I understand it. So there's a strong connection to, um, uh, to Mr. Lawrenson. Uh, through his life and generosity, Norm helped to build a joyful, just, and more trustworthy world. And in honor of that legacy, the Lawrenson Center takes up this question, how do we build a more trustworthy world? The language of trust is a part of the rich Lutheran heritage in which Concordia is rooted and grounded. Uh, within that tradition, human beings put their trust in a benevolent God, their creator, who acts with mercy, compassion, and justice. But human beings, in turn, are also responsible for co-creating a world that is similarly merciful, compassionate, and just. Today's event features uh, the voice and research of Dr. Dr. John Bitson, and in particular, the recently published results from the 2023 American College Student Freedom, Progress, and Flourishing Survey. Dr. Bitson is the Men Menard Family Director of the Sheila and Robert Challey Institute for Global Innovation and Growth, and a professor of management at NDSU, our neighbor across the way. He studies transportation economics, the impacts of regulation, and market structure and performance. His research has spanned public policy issues related to railroads, airlines, motor carriers, waterways, and public transit, including examining ec economic issues such as transportation costs, energy consumption, pricing, profitability, and regulatory change. Dr. Bitson has co-edited three books on transportation economics and published research in top academic journals such as Southern Economic Journal, Journal of Law and Economics, Journal of Transport Economics and Policy, Review of Industrial Organization, and more. Uh, his work has also been published in Entrepreneur Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, The Hill, Washington Examiner, and Newsweek. And uh, John, you've been at NDSU since 1990, I understand. So um, we offer you a warm Concordia welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, thanks, Michael, for the nice introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate the invitation being here today. Um, I'll let you know that my talk is geared towards students, I thought. <laughs> there aren't any students here, or, or not. I mean, you all look like students, but I think I've been introduced to you, then I, I guess my understanding is that you're not students. Uh, <laughs> But uh, so uh, as Michael said, I want to present the results of our most recent survey that looks at student attitudes towards viewpoint diversity and free speech, student understanding of human progress, and then students' understanding of different economic systems, capitalism and socialism and their implications. So our methodology is that we did a nationwide survey in collaboration with College Pulse last May, and we did the survey of four-year student, students at four-year institutions, colleges, and universities. Uh, we surveyed 2,250 university students at 131 different universities. You see the demographics of our sample here. Uh, you'll note that we also asked about political ideology because a lot of the results in the survey vary based on political ideology as well. And there's a post-stratification weighting applied to make sure that we have a representative sample of nationwide college students. So when I've presented some of these results or presented them in writing before, uh, sometimes they've been represented as this is NDSU. This is, none of these students are at NDSU, okay? These are students nationwide. Uh, so I want to start out and just ask about, and I said university, so let's think about this as a university or a college, okay, Concordia. So what is the talos of a university? So this is a picture of Aristotle, and Aristotle talked about everything has a talos or an end, a purpose, a goal. And so let's think about what is the end, the purpose, the goal of a university. And so you can think about, well, what is the talos of business is to earn profit. What is the talos of medicine is health. 
What is the talos of an automobile, efficient transportation? Uh, what is the talos of a knife to cut sharply? And so I think we could get some insight into what the talos of a university or a college is by looking at some of the logos or the seals, the crests of different famous universities. So let's start out with Harvard. So if you look at Harvard, in Latin, veritas okay, means truth. So it says truth in their crest. If you look at University of Pittsburgh, truth is virtue. University uh, or Northwestern University, all that is true. Uh, Seoul National University, truth is my light. Washington University in, in St. Louis, strength through truth. Yale, light and truth. I have a friend that actually watched me present this and he said, how did you not uh, start laughing or when you, when you started saying Harvard and truth and this, I mean, but anyway, so uh, we can talk about different <laughs> universities later on. But, I, but Concordia is not any you know, exception. So if you look at the mission statement of any college or university, you're gonna probably find something about advancing scientific knowledge or seeking the truth. And so I just wanna read to you the mission of Concordia. So Concordia's mission is, the purpose of Concordia College is to influence the affairs of the world by sending into society thoughtful and informed men and women dedicated to the Christian life. Then it says, what do we do? We seek the truth and we ask hard questions. Okay, so we seek the truth, ask hard questions with nothing off limits to inquiry and critique. We encourage students to discover and explore their passionate convictions through civil discourse. Um, we also recognize the complexities of life demand more than either or thinking and simple answers. We embrace intellectual humility in the face of paradox and ambiguity. So if this is true about what the college campus is like at a Concordia, that's great, that's awesome for you because when you see the results of our survey, that's not what's being practiced nationwide. Um, so how do universities advance scientific knowledge? And so if you think about advancing scientific knowledge in any discipline, we think about using the scientific method. So roughly, we think about making an observation of the world. Okay, so we observe something in the world and we try to explain it, but we know that the world is so complex that we have to develop a model to try to simplify the world so that we can make actual explanations. And so in economics, okay, my field, in economics, we have very simple models to explain markets. We have supply and demand, for example. Um, and then we use our model to generate a hypothesis. So in economics, we have demand, so we expect that if the price of gasoline goes up, okay, the quantity that people purchase probably is gonna go down. Once we hold constant other things like income levels, the prices of automobiles, the prices of substitute products. So we develop a hypothesis. Then we test our hypothesis. So we might have data on gasoline prices over time, quantities purchased over time, income levels over time, prices of automobiles over time, um, et cetera. And then we go ahead and we try to test it. But in general, when we test our hypothesis, Okay, we can prove that a hypothesis is false, but we never prove that it's true. So we provide evidence supporting it, you know, but we never can absolutely say that it's true. So we continue to test it, test it, test it, test it again. And then we publish our results. Um, and when we publish our results, it goes through peer review. And then our results are always under constant scrutiny by the academic community. So one very important part about some of the scientific method is that we're always open to new data, new information. Okay, we may think that we know something and then new data comes out and it conflicts what we originally thought. Okay, so the whole idea, and I know you've heard this before, of saying the science is settled, that's very unscientific to say that. Okay, that's not a correct statement. Um, so in addition to advancing scientific knowledge, what's the number one skill that universities aim to teach? So, I, I don't, I'm doing this because we don't have students here, so I want, if I'm coming here, so I'm thinking about being a Concordia student, so what's the number one skill that you're teaching students at Concordia? Anyone want to say? Oh, yeah, very good, all right, okay, so I'm guessing that that's probably the number one answer nationwide. That's a guess, this is not based on a survey, but I'm going to say critical thinking as well, so. Okay, so your name is? 
Layla, so great job. Gold star for you today. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm too, yeah, you showed up just in time to answer that. Thank you. It was, this was not a setup. I have not met her yet. Okay, and so there's a variety of definitions. One I really like from UC Berkeley says that critical thinkers rigorously question ideas and assumptions rather than accepting them at face value. They will always seek to determine whether ideas, arguments, and findings represent the entire picture, and they're open to finding out that they are not. So in other words, I may think, you know, I may have some opinion, some idea, but I'm always open to the fact that I might be presented with new information, new data, that presents a fuller picture and maybe makes me change my mind. Um, and interestingly, a National Association of Colleges and Employers, they did a survey of employers in 2022. Um, and in their survey, 98.5% of employers said that critical thinking was a very important skill for college graduates to have. But only 56% said that the college graduates that they had experienced were proficient in critical thinking. And I think that might get to some of the rest of this survey, actually. Um, so can universities, I want to ask a question, so can universities seek the truth and teach critical thinking while only considering one point of view? Okay, you probably know the way I'm going to answer this, and I would say definitely not. Because again, if we're talking about advancing scientific knowledge, you're always open to new information okay, that may you know, present a better picture, similarly with critical thinking. I think this is stated very well by John Stuart Mill in 1859 in On Liberty. And John Stuart Mill said, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. His reasons may be good, and no one may have been able to refute them. But if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he doesn't even know what the reasons are on the opposite side, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. And I think that's a really good way of stating it, is that if you don't even know what the counter arguments are to your opinion, okay, how do you know that your opinion is the best opinion? Okay, and just think about what is the value of understanding the counter arguments. One would be, well, maybe I change my opinion. Okay, maybe some of the, the counter arguments, some aspects of that, I adopt and blend them with my own arguments and come up with you know, a third alternative, or maybe I'm able to sharpen my own arguments more by understanding the counter arguments. And so I think, again, understanding different points of view is very important to critical thinking and to seeking the truth and advancing scientific knowledge. Um, also, I want to point out that free speech has played historically a very, very important role in protecting minorities. So our founding fathers were very cognizant of the possibility that if you have a pure democracy, that it's vulnerable to the tyranny of the majority. And the idea is that the majority can just, you know, have their will trample the rights of minorities, okay, with no check on that. And so that's why there's, you know, three branches of government, why we have a variety of checks and balances in our constitution to make sure that minorities are protected from the tyranny of the majority. Um, and as I said, it's played a very important role in protecting rights of minorities over time. So the First Amendment was not included in the original Constitution, but it was in the Bill of Rights. It was discussed by the framers of the Constitution when they were framing it with the idea that they were going to put this in right away in the Bill of Rights right after it, which they did. Um, and so if you look at speeches of Martin Luther King Jr., you'll see that he talks very eloquently about the importance of the First Amendment, importance of free speech in enabling the civil rights movement. Uh, another very uh, famous and important civil rights leader, John Lewis, said that without free speech, the civil rights movement would have been a word, bird without wings. And somehow in academia, and I don't know how, but somehow in academia, this has been flipped. And the whole idea is that free speech is used by the majority to, you know, to somehow um, have power over minorities or to trample the rights of minorities. It's exactly the opposite of that. The majority doesn't need free speech, okay? They can have their will seen because they are the majority. It is, in fact, the minority that needs free speech to protect their rights. Um, so this is a question I'm going to ask all of you, and I know that you're not in class, okay? So just think about this in terms of being in a group. So I want to, and you have to answer Okay, otherwise I'm going to ask you to leave, okay? Okay, so, I'm going to, so you have to answer one way or the other. You have to raise your hand. So 
Do you feel comfortable sharing your opinion on a controversial or sensitive topic in class or in a group? Okay, so how many people would say yes, you feel comfortable sharing your opinion on a controversial or sensitive topic? Okay, how many people would say no? Did you raise, okay, okay, thank you. You almost had to leave, so Allison. Okay, yeah, so yeah, so most people are saying no in here. So what about when we ask this in our nationwide survey? So in our nationwide survey, when we asked this, we found that 71% of students said they're at least somewhat comfortable sharing their opinions on controversial or sensitive topics in class. But only 23% said that they were very comfortable sharing their opinions on controversial or sensitive topics in class. By the way, this does vary based on students' uh, political ideology. So we found that 79% of liberal-leaning students said they were at least somewhat comfortable sharing their opinions on controversial or sensitive topics, compared to 59% of conservative students. Um, so you look at this and you say, well, you know, students aren't self-censoring. It doesn't seem like you know, the speech climate is a problem, really. But then, we asked the students that said they were comfortable sharing their opinions on controversial or sensitive topics in class, why are you comfortable sharing your opinions? And we found that half the students that said they were comfortable sharing their opinions said the reason they're comfortable is that they think that most other students' and professors' views align with their own. So they're not really comfortable sharing their opinions on controversial topics, they're comfortable sharing them because they think everyone else agrees with them. Okay, the other half said they're comfortable regardless of what other people think. Um, again, this varies by political ideology. 55% of liberal-leaning students said the reason they're comfortable is because they think most uh, students and professors agree with them. 30% of conservative students said that. Then we asked the students that said they're not comfortable sharing their opinions, why are you not comfortable sharing your opinions? And we found that 72% were concerned that their opinions would be considered unacceptable by other students. 45% said they were concerned that their opinions would be considered unacceptable by professors, and 47% were concerned about their reputations. Uh, when we compare liberal-leaning students and conservative-leaning students, conservative-leaning students tend to be more concerned about the opinions of professors and their own reputations compared to liberal-leaning students but most students tend to be very concerned about the opinions of other students. Um, then we asked students, do your professors create a classroom climate in which people with unpopular views would feel comfortable sharing their opinions? And we found that 73% said yes, professors do create a climate where people with unpopular views feel comfortable sharing their opinions. Again, this varies by political ideology. 78% of liberal-leaning students said this compared to 61% of conservative-leaning students say, saying this. Okay, this is another one that you have to answer here. So, if many students disagree with the views of someone who's been invited to speak on campus, should the university or college withdraw the speaker's invitation? So, how many people would say yes? Okay, raise your hands high. Okay, how many people would say no? Okay, everyone said no, okay. Um, so, so I think you agree with me that this is going to be disturbing. When we, when we asked this of our students in the nationwide survey, although the majority said that the speaker should not be disinvited, over a third said that this, the speaker should be disinvited if this is the case. Um, and that comparing liberal-leaning and conservative-leaning students, 44% of liberal-leaning students said the, the speaker should be withdrawn, invitation should be withdrawn compared to 18% of conservative leaning students. What about if a required reading for a college class includes content that makes students feel uncomfortable? Should the reading be dropped as a requirement? Okay, how many people say yes? Okay, how many people say no? Okay, again, we have unanimous, everyone says no. When we asked students in our nationwide survey, 42% said if a required reading in a college class includes content that makes students feel uncomfortable, the reading should be dropped as a requirement. Um, again, this varies by political ideology somewhat. Uh, what about this one? Okay, what if a professor, so, so how many people are professors in here? Raise your hands. Okay, we'll see if the professors answer this differently than other people. If a professor says something that students find to be offensive, 
Should the professor be reported to the university? Okay, how many people say yes? Okay, we have, we have one yes at least. How many people say no? Okay, not everyone raise your hands. Okay, so we're going to do it one more time. How many people say yes? Okay, how many people say no? Okay, so majority are saying no on this one. Okay, when we asked this of students nationwide, 74% said if a professor says something that students deem to be offensive, the professor should be reported to the university. 81% of liberal leading students say that this is the case. So a legitimate concern that some people might have, so this is the third year we've done the survey, and we got similar results on this question the previous two years. So some people have said, well, maybe the students are concerned that professors are gonna launch a racist attack or a personal attack or engage in sexual harassment. Okay, so those, that's legitimate. So, okay, so what I did was added some extra questions this year to see is that really what students are concerned about? Okay, let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you, which of the following statements should a professor be reported for? Okay, so you have to vote on these, please. Okay, so if a professor says in class, it's clear that affirmative action is doing more harm than good and it should be eliminated, Okay, should that professor be reported to the university or college? Okay, how many people say yes? Raise your hands high. Okay, how many people say no? Okay, no's, the no's win on that one. What about if you, a professor says, if you look at the data, there's no evidence of anti-black bias in police shootings. Should the professor be reported for saying that? How many people say yes? How many people say no? Okay, the no's have it on that one. What about if a professor says, owning a gun is a right of every US citizen? Should the professor be reported? How many people say yes? How many people say no? Okay, what if a uh, professor says, biological sex is a scientific fact. There are two sexes, male and female. Should the professor be reported? How many people say yes? How many people say no? I don't think everyone voted on that one, but I, I'll let you slip on that one, okay? What about if requiring vaccination for COVID is an assault on individual freedom? A professor says that. Should they be reported? How many people say yes? How many people say no? Okay, so this, they're not all one-sided, so we'll listen, now let's look at the other, some other. How about if a professor says, those who want to eliminate affirmative action are perpetuating white privilege? How many people say the professor should be reported for saying that. How many people say no? Okay, what about if a professor says, it's clear we have a problem with racist police in the United States shooting unarmed black men. How many people would say a professor should be reported for saying that? How many people would say no? Okay, what if a professor says, a civilized society doesn't need guns. Should the professor be reported? How many people say yes? How many people say no? Okay, what if a professor says there are a, a variety of sexes, sex is not binary? Should a professor be reported for saying that? Okay, how many people say yes? Okay, how many people say no? Okay, some people voted twice. You know, I, no, I, I, I'm kidding, I, I fooled the way I asked the question, I fooled you, okay. Okay, what about if uh, some, the professor says not getting vaccinated for COVID is irresponsible and inconsiderate to others? Professor, should we report it? How many people say yes? How many people say no? Okay, so if you look at these questions, these questions are not personal attacks. They're not racist attacks. They're not, you know, sexual harassment. Okay, these are statements of opinion or fact. Yet, when we ask students nationwide, which of these things should professors be reported for, 65% said that professors should be reported for saying one or more of these statements. Okay, so this represents to me an environment where students are not tolerant of viewpoints that they disagree with. Well, but you may think, well, is this just liberal students? No, it's both liberal and conservative students. We found that 75% of liberal students are in favor of reporting professors for saying more, one or more of these things. 41% of conservative students are in favor of doing so. Um, what about if a student says something that other students find to be offensive? Should the student be reported to university? How many people say yes? How many people say no? Okay. 
58 uh, percent uh, of students in our nationwide survey said other students should be reported if they say something that students find to be offensive. And liberal leaning students, 66 percent said yes. Um, so this is an apparent contradiction. So if you look at wide, broad measures of openness to different points of view, it looks pretty good. I mean, we see that, you know, 44 percent of students say the classroom climate is one that allows diverse points of view. 83% say professors encourage a wide variety of perspectives. 73% say that the un unpopular views are welcome in the classroom. And 71% say they're at least somewhat comfortable sharing their opinions on controversial or sensitive topics in class. So it looks like there's nothing to look at here. You know, the classroom climate is open to different points of view, robust debate, et cetera. But when we start looking at opinions that student have, students have, on whether they're in favor of taking measures to prevent other people from speaking, it doesn't look so good. 31% are in favor of dropping readings that students disagree with. 31% are in favor of dropping class discussions that make students feel uncomfortable. 35% are in favor of disinviting speakers. 42% are in favor of dropping readings that make students feel uncomfortable. And we already talked about 74% and 58% are in favor of reporting professors and students respectively. So, this contradiction to me is very interesting. I'm wondering, the students that say that the classroom climate is open to a wide variety of viewpoints, do they really think it's open to a wide variety of viewpoints or do they think it's open to their viewpoints and they're not gonna be the ones that are canceled? So I just did a very, it's a statistical test. I'm not gonna go into the details, but I do wanna show you this. So if you look at all of the six different actions that students could take to prevent others from speaking, those six things on the bottom, I gave each of those a zero or one value. So one if they're in favor of doing that, zero if they're not. So one if they're in favor of reporting a professor, it gets a one. If they're not in favor of it, it gets a zero. We add these all up, it creates a variable that ranges between zero and six. Zero means I'm not in favor of doing any of these things. Six means in favor, I'm in favor of doing all of them. I'm in favor of reporting professors, reporting students, disinviting speakers, dropping readings, you know, et cetera, dropping discussions. Um, and so I'm gonna call that being in favor of taking illiberal actions. And so that's my dependent variable in my regression. I just wanna focus on two different things. So if you look at the, the fourth line down, it says the classroom climate where those with diverse views feel comfortable sharing their opinions. So, Students that say the classroom climate is one where people with diverse views would feel comfortable sharing their opinions, they are also more, and likely, more likely to be in favor of reporting other students, more likely to be in favor of reporting professors, et cetera. Students that say the classroom climate is one with people, where people with unpopular views would feel comfortable sharing their opinions are also more likely to be in favor of reporting other students, dropping readings, et cetera. So to me, this shows that it's consistent, it's not, Puzzle or anything like that, but it's consistent with the idea that these students are saying that the classroom climate is open to my points of view, not necessarily all points of view. So free speech for me, but not for thee, is the way I would say that, so what that looks like. Um, so, why, so I want to focus now on the second part of our survey. The second part of our survey looks at human progress. So why should we understand the state of the world and how it's changed? Um, one, if we want to make improvements in the world, we need to understand the changes that have occurred over time and why those changes have occurred over time. Second, if we want to understand what things should we focus on to make future improvements in the world, we need to understand the past and how things have changed and what the world is like now. Also, if we want to know what kinds of things should we be worried about, what kinds of things should we not be worried about, and what kind of expectations can we form for the future, we should understand how progress has occurred over time. And also, if we want to understand how to make the world better, okay, we need to understand uh, how the world has changed. Um, so when we ask students in our nationwide survey, do you think that your college education is helping you develop a more accurate view of the world? Most students say yes, 77% say yes. Uh, for, particularly for liberal-leaning students, 86% say yes. 62% um, of conservative-leaning students say yes. So has the world gotten better? And it depends on what we're talking about. I mean, are we talking about civil discourse? Are we talking about poverty? Are we talking about hunger? What are we talking about? I want to ask you in terms of three things. So first of all, let's look at extreme poverty. So since 1990, 
has the world gotten better in terms of extreme poverty? Has it gotten worse? Or has it stayed the same? How many people would say, in terms of extreme poverty since 1990, the world has gotten better? Okay, how many people would say it's gotten worse? Okay, how many people would say it's unchanged? Okay. So let's look at the evidence. So in 1990, 38% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty. Today, it's 9%. So that's since 1990. So it's gotten markedly better. Okay. If you go back further, it's even a bigger improvement. Uh, what about global life expectancy? Has global life expectancy increased? How many people would say it's increased since 1973? How many people would say decreased? How many people would say it stayed the same? Okay, so since 1973, life expectancy was 58 years globally. In 1973, it's 71 years today. So again, gotten markedly better. What about literacy? Has literacy improved since 1980? How many people would say yes? How many people would say it's gotten worse. Many people would say it stayed the same. <laughs> okay, you're jaded from teaching too much, I think. So. <laughs> uh, so, but actually, global literacy has improved a lot. So 56% of the world's population could read in 1980. Uh, today, it's 87%. But when we asked students in our nationwide survey, and we asked them specifically in terms of life expectancy, literacy, and extreme poverty, okay, has the world gotten better? worse or stay the same in the last 50 years, only 47% think the world has gotten better in the last 50 years. And this doesn't really vary based on um, political ideology. So why has the world improved? Okay, there's strong evidence, in fact, that increased economic freedom has led to more prosperity. So when I define increased economic freedom, how is it defined? based on a smaller government. So the idea with a smaller government is that individual decisions replace government decisions. Um, protection of property rights and a predictable legal system means more economic freedom. Stable inflation, free international trade, limited regulation of labor, credit, and business. A study by Robert Lawson in 2022 looked at over 700 different studies that had looked at the relationship between economic freedom and flourishing, and 51% of them found a positive relationship between economic freedom and flourishing. About 5% found a negative relationship between the two, and the remaining studies didn't find conclusively a relationship. But still, this is good evidence to suggest that economic freedom has led to increased prosperity. Um, this is just a couple of charts I wanted to show you. So the uh, Fraser Institute measures economic freedom in the world every year. Um, and this is from the Fraser Institute. So they categorize countries in the world as being least economically free and most economically free. And this is a comparison of poverty rates in the least economically free countries compared to the most economically free countries. In the least economically free countries, poverty rates range between 32% and 74%, depending on how you define poverty. In the most economically free countries, it ranges between 1% and 5.5%. Um, and then looking at uh, economic freedom and life expectancy, in the least economically free countries in the world, average life expectancy is 65 years. In the most economically free countries in the world, it's 81 years. A really a big example is China. In 1978, they started to pursue economic reform under Deng Xiaoping, and they phased out their agricultural collectives. They privatized their farming. They eliminated a state monopoly on foreign trade, they allowed foreign investment, and they reduced their trade barriers. What happened to poverty in China as a result of that? So in 1980, 90% of China's population lived in extreme poverty. Okay. By 2016, it was 4%. So dramatic reduction in poverty as a result of economic reforms and more economic freedom. Um, so, and so we asked students, the students that said, the world has gotten better over the last 50 years, we asked them, why has the world gotten better? And those students were more likely to attribute the improvement in the world to more economic and political freedom than they were to increase government rules, regulations, and programs to redistribute resources. On the other hand, we asked the students that think the world has gotten worse, why has it gotten worse? And they're more likely to attribute it to not enough government rules, regulations, and programs to redistribute resources than they are to not enough economic and political freedom. 
So to me, this is super interesting because the students that understand the progress that the world has made also have a better understanding of the mechanisms that lead to that progress. Um, and then, um, you probably are not surprised, we ask students, are you optimistic about the future of the world? Well, most students don't know about the progress the world has made, so consequently, they're not very optimistic about the future of the world. Only 30% say they're optimistic about the future of the world. Um, then we ask the similar questions about the United States. So do you think that your college education is helping you develop a more accurate picture of the United States? 77% of college students said yes. Then we ask students, based on what you've learned in college so far, do you think that life in the United States has been getting better or worse over the last 50 years in terms of life expectancy, income per person, and education level? So if you look at these numbers in the United States in, over that time period, um, life expectancy in 1972 in the United States was 71.2 years. Uh, today, it's 77 and a half years, so life expectancy has improved. Uh, real per person income has more than doubled in the last 50 years. Um, and if you look at education level, in 1975, 62 and a half percent of the population 25 and over had a high school education. Um, now it's 91.2 percent. College education, 13.9 percent of population had a college education at that time period, now it's 38%. Okay, so all of these things have gotten markedly better for the United States as well, yet when we ask students in our nationwide survey, only 41% think the United States has improved in terms of these things over that time period. Then when we ask them, similarly to our other question, we ask the students that think the United States has gotten better, why has the United States gotten better? They're more likely to attribute it to a dynamic marketplace where entrepreneurs and others innovate to solve problems than they are to increase government programs to redistribute resources. But the students that think the United States has gotten worse say we don't have enough government programs to uh, make sure that resources are redistributed. They're more likely to attribute it to that than too many regulations restricting innovators from solving problems. So again, the students that understand progress have a better understanding of the mechanisms leading to that progress. Um, and then you're probably not surprised that students tend to not be very optimistic about the future of the United States either. Only 25% are optimistic about the future of the United States. Okay, what about optimism about their own futures? Okay, so I know that all of you deal with students. Do you think that students are generally optimistic about their own futures? Okay, I mean, shouldn't they be? This is a, I mean, they're in college. Okay, this is a time when you're acquiring all those skills, you have your whole life in front of you. Um, so I was disappointed that only 52% of students said they're optimistic about their own futures. Um, and then I just wanna go to the last section of our survey. So do views on capitalism and socialism matter? I wanna ask that question. And of course they do. Prosperity is affected by economic systems. And so if we, understand capitalism and socialism and understand their implications, okay, we'll know what kind of system do we want to have in the United States. Also, intelligent debates on the merits of different types of economic systems rely on a common understanding of what they mean. So I might say that capitalism is awesome, and then Michael says capitalism is the worst, okay? But maybe we're talking about two different definitions of capitalism. How can we even debate it if we're not talking about the same thing? Um, if we determine, uh, if we want to determine the desirability uh, of a particular economic system, we need to know what they mean. Whether we want to advocate for that system or not, we need to understand what they mean. We also need to have a common understanding of what they mean. So again, I may say socialism is the best, and so I'm going to advocate for socialism. Okay, and then Bernie Sanders has a different definition of socialism, and so then I'm rooting for Bernie Sanders, and then all of a sudden Bernie Sanders is like, okay, we're gonna implement what you wanted. I might not like what I bought into. So I think it's very important to have a common definition and really to understand what their implications are. Um, so which of the following definitions, okay, this is a quiz that everyone is gonna have to take in here. So which of the following definitions of capitalism is correct? So is it an economic system in which property is privately owned, exchange is voluntary, 
And the production and pricing of goods and services is determined by market forces. That's definition A. Definition B is it's an economic system in which corporations utilize grants, special tax breaks, political connections, and special rules that favor them over competitors to earn profits. Okay. Or is it, that's B, or is it neither? So how many people would say definition A? How many people would say definition B? How many people would say neither? Okay, so definition A is free market capitalism. Definition B, does anyone know another name for definition B? It also starts with a C. Yeah, cronyism, yeah, so it's cronyism. And so when we asked students um, in our nationwide survey this question, we found that 56% are defining capitalism as free market capitalism, but 30% are confusing cronyism with capitalism, and 14% say they don't know what it is. And so, again, this means that students, how can they even talk about it? They don't even have a common definition of what capitalism is. We also asked students, do they have a positive or a negative view of capitalism? But again, we don't know what they're defining. Um, and we find that more students had a negative view of capitalism than a positive view of capitalism. Um, and then just, again, because I like regressions, uh, I just did an exploratory thing just to look at what kinds of things influence student attitudes towards capitalism. And we find that if students define capitalism as free market capitalism, they tend to have a much more positive definition of cap or positive view of capitalism. And then we find that if professors say that capitalism has a lot of positive things, students tend to have a more positive view of capitalism. If professors say capitalism is the worst, okay, students tend to have a more negative view of capitalism. Um, then let's ask the same thing about socialism. So which of the following definitions of socialism is correct? Is it an economic system in which the types, quantities produced, and prices of goods and services are planned by the government and properties owned by society? Okay, that's definition A. Definition B, an economic system in which individuals and companies make decisions on the types, quantities produced, and prices charged for most goods and services, but the government plays a very active role in assuring that prices are fair and assuring an equitable distribution of resources between rich and poor. That's B. Or is it neither? How many people would say A is the correct definition? Okay, how many people would say B is the correct definition? Okay, how many people would say neither? Okay, so we've got a mixture here. So the first one is the classic definition of socialism. Okay, central planning, that's the classic definition. The second one is I'm gonna call hyper redistribution. Okay, that's like the Nordic model, but the Nordic model, that's, those are not socialist countries, by the way. We should read the book Socialism Sucks if you wanna know what the real implications of socialism are. I, I would, well, you know from the title, but you should read it anyway. So, uh, but anyway, um, so when I ask students, uh, when we ask students in our nationwide survey about this, uh, we find that more students define socialism using the hyper redistribution definition than using the classic definition of socialism. Um, and then when we ask students, do they have a positive or negative view of socialism, more students have a positive view of socialism than a negative view of socialism. Um, and then looking at, again, what kinds of things influence student attitudes towards socialism, we find that if students define socialism using the central planning definition, the classic definition, they tend to have a more negative view of socialism and professors do in fact influence student views towards socialism in positive and negative ways. Um, so a summary, um, I'm sorry, this, I just have like a few more minutes, is that okay? Okay, so yeah, universities and colleges aren't as open to different points of view as they should be. Um, a lot of students aren't aware of human progress um, and they tend to be less optimistic because of that. Uh, students don't have a common understanding of capitalism and socialism and universities are contributing to this. Um, but I just want to talk a little bit about some solutions. So Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, FIRE, um, they give some very interesting solutions. I think one of the first one is they say the university or college should adopt an official commitment to free speech. So essentially it's very symbolic, but something in writing saying that our university is committed to free inquir inquiry, committed to free speech, okay? And there's something called the Chicago Statement. It's a two-page statement. The faculty just has to say, we endorse this, and essentially that's saying our university is committed to it. 
Uh, I think that Concordia has already taken a great step. You have it right on your website. We're committed to free inquiry. So as long as people buy into it, I mean, it might be another step for faculty to vote on it to say, yes, we agree with this. It wasn't just as some administrator saying this. Um, also, I think teaching students about free speech and academic freedom at orientation, I think beyond that, even a class on free speech would be great to teach students historically that, again, Free speech has played a huge role in minority movements, and it's very important at universities for critical thinking and advancing scientific knowledge. I think universities and colleges across the United States should all require a class in free speech. Um, get rid of speech codes and bias response teams. Okay, so if you have a speech code, what does that do? That says, these are the things you can't say. Okay, I mean, is that a, an environment of open inquiry? No, you're telling me I have to watch the things that I say. Bias response teams encourage people to report on other people, okay? So if you're encouraging people to write down things other people say and report on them, that doesn't create an environment where people are gonna feel free to uh, state their own opinions. Um, survey students and faculty about the free, state of free speech on campus. Measure, you know, are there problems with free speech and can we measure progress over time? Um, defend students and professors from cancellation. Okay, you may disagree with something that a professor or a student says, and you may feel like, well, right now, the climate, speech climate is in my favor. It might turn on you someday, and you may want to, again, defend somebody else's right to speak. Um, other things, we, at NDSU, we have reading groups. These are voluntary reading groups, but we have students that engage in readings on both sides of an issue and they engage in discussion with other students that they disagree with. I think that's a good thing to do. Uh, teach students about human progress and found its foundations. So we have a class at NDSU called the Human Progress and Flourishing Workshop. There's a really outstanding teacher that teaches that class. Okay, <laughs> that's me, but anyway, so, so um, anyway, but we have that. Um, and then we have a class called Market Values that teaches students, this is what socialism is, this is what capitalism is, this is what their implications are. I think that's a good thing. Um, and then I just had some recommendations. These are mo mostly for students, but for other people as well. So develop in-person real friendships. Okay, your online friends are not gonna defend you when somebody tries to cancel you, okay, but your real friends will. It also, you, ha you know the person, you know they're a good person, you know they have good intent. Okay, but online you don't have that same relationship. Make friends with people you disagree with. Again, you think about, you know, Michael and I may disagree on something, okay, but I know that we have the same intent. I mean, I'm not, I don't know if we disagree or not, but I'm just saying, <laughs> but just two people, I'm just saying, so, so in other words, we both want to improve poverty, okay? His solution may be completely different than mine, but if you make friends with someone you disagree with, you understand that, well, they don't have bad intent, Okay, they have the same goal as I do, but they just have a different way of trying to achieve it. Um, also, read news outlets that you disagree with. You know, understand, as John Stuart Mill said, understand the arguments on the other side. Um, and that's my next point here. Avoid ad hominem attacks. This is the worst way to make an argument, but it's also one of the most popular ways to make an argument today, um, especially on social media. So an ad hominem attack means you're attacking the individual, you're not actually attacking the argument. Okay, so somebody, if I say something that somebody disagrees with, instead of saying why they disagree with me, you know, a better point to say like, well, this is a reason why my point is better, they say, well, you know, he's a conservative or he's a liberal, okay, or he's this kind of phobe or whatever. I mean, so basically you dismiss the person and then anything that they say after that, you don't have to listen to because you've already dismissed the person. Okay, that is the worst way to attack. It, to me, it's, it signifies that you have a weak argument yourself if you have to rely on that, but people do rely on that, so don't do that. Um, defend other people's right to express their opinion even if you disagree with it. Look at the data to understand the world. And then finally, I think very importantly, be open to being wrong. I think we need more intellectual humility, and I think that's even in Concordia's, the, the points below the mission statement. So again, intellectual humility is really good. As professors, we need to understand that we may be wrong too. So, so thanks, uh, sorry I went a little bit longer, but thanks, thanks for listening, appreciate it.
Um, th thank you so much. You have given us just an immense amount of material to uh, to talk about. And in terms of the timing, I know some of you will have to leave at the one o'clock hour. That's fine. Just feel free to get up and go. No big deal. We'll go a few minutes over just to make time for questions. And um, it, like I said, so much data in there, John. Thank you so much for the for the presentation and for keeping it lively as well. <laughs> um, what I want to do is open the microphone up to our audience members right now because I have to imagine that something that you heard in there sparked a question or something of interest, uh, whether it's, there are three sec three different sections. One has to do kind of with student opinions, another on, uh, what was section number two, remind okay, me? So the first one is on, yeah, you, uh, sorry, first one is on free speech and viewpoint diversity. The second point is on human progress, understanding of human progress. Third is on understanding uh, capitalism and socialism. Yeah, yeah. And their so get those questions queued up, and when you have them, use the microphone right over here uh, on stage right to just stand up and go there, and that will allow our folks on Zoom to, um, uh, to hear you. And I will start off with a question while folks are getting in, in the queue. Um, one, of the, one of the things you note in your study is that students are afraid of one another. They're afraid of having opinions is, what, is maybe a better way to say it. And I think there's a part of this that has to be part of the broader culture, maybe even the online culture. I don't, I'm not, and I don't think colleges necessarily have all the levers to control that particular environment. But when you think about that dynamic and students being afraid to have alternative opinions or being shamed or canceled, whatever it would be, what, what are some of the things that can be done on the classroom level? Let's keep it focused there on the classroom to help address that. Yeah, I mean, so that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Um, so again, my class is, um, I don't know, do we still have tri-college classes that students from Concordia can take classes at NDSU? Okay, yes. so let your students know about it. So <laughs> anyway, so, no, but my class, in addition to teaching the foundations of human progress and flourishing, so we have speakers that come to the class as well. And then in the off weeks, we have discussions about the topics that the speakers talked about. We also have topics on things that we read about. We're reading The Canceling of the American Mind right now, which is a book by Greg Lukianoff, uh, who is the president of FIRE. Um, but uh, in that class, I make students understand that we want to have a robust discussion, and they know that they're not going to get graded based on their opinions, and I want them to uh, understand that it's going to be a comfortable environment. You can disagree with each other. You can disagree with me, um, and just create an environment where students feel comfortable expressing themselves, and they know they're not going to get graded on their opinions. I think... Um, I've done that in the class and the students, it's so, I just leave that class energized because it's, I ask each of the question, students to bring two questions to class related to our previous speaker or some of the readings, and then they ask the questions and then it just generates a great discussion throughout the entire period. Um, and they're not, the students are not worried about, you know, offending other students. They, I think they just respect each other and understand. I think we need to just emphasize again that you know, these are other people that have good intentions as well. Um, and just, let's just have a discussion together and not, you know, not engage in ad hominem attacks and also um, just assume that there's goodwill on the part of the other person. Sure. Great. Daryl, please. Thank you. Well, th thank you for the information that you've shared with us. Um, so, you know, during the same period of time kind of that, that you have framed your information, um, there's a, a concurrent um, decrease in mental health, um, increases in depression, increases in anxiety. And I was just curious if you've done any kind of um, maybe informal inquiries into correlations there. I, I, I haven't, but I mean, but I, I did attend uh, the so Foundation for Individual, Individual Rights and Expression Fire. I attended their faculty conference and other people talked about that, at, you know, at the conference and and I do think, I, th I think you're right. I mean, I think the whole, uh, I think Michael alluded to the online culture. I think the online culture contributes to both the mental health issues and contributes to the free speech issues. Because I, you know, I think that people, um, I mean, how do you, you know, how do you get joy out of when you post stuff? So you post stuff and then like how many people like it? Okay, so I mean, I think it relates a little bit to when we're looking at being concerned about other people's opinions. like. How come Jimmy didn't like my post? You know, is there some some kind of you know problem with it? You know, is my post not the right opinion? And then now it's evolved where if you don't respond in any way online, then you're part of the problem because you're not saying anything. So like, are you supposed to say something? Or are you supposed to not say something? Or like, you know, what I mean, it's like everything ends up being a kind of a cancellation. And I think it does have an influence on 
mental health. I also think the online thing, um, you always present like the best, the, I mean, you, do, you don't, you present like you're on vacation somewhere fun, but you don't present like, well, here I'm sick in bed or, you know, I mean, most people don't do that. I mean, so, so you see, you're comparing your real life to somebody else's fantasy life on online. And I think that contributes to uh, a mental health problem as well. But I do think like the, the need for approval, I think is related to students being concerned about other other students' opinions and also to the mental health issues. I don't know if that's a great answer to it, but thanks. Thanks, Gerald. Are there other audience questions? Someone else want to post something? Please, Pam. Another dynamic at play in this conversation, I think, is the debates about the expectations that students bring to college. So go back to the Telos question. Mm -hmm. There's a great book out there called The Real World of College that's really interested in different mindsets that, that students bring. And the two that are of interest are a transactional consumerist vision versus a transformational. Here at a place like Concordia, we love to talk about transformation. Uh, I was involved in international education here for a number of years, and one of the ways we wanted to sell international education to our students was go abroad and change your lives. Turns out, you know, that there's a real disparity between men and women with respect to wanting to study abroad, and we tried to get the best answers on why men were increasingly not interested in going abroad. When I was an undergraduate in the 70s, it was pretty even, uh, men and women, but something has changed. And the best data was that there's a kind of a bro culture on many campuses where men understand that if they go abroad, they are going to change and they're going to come back different, and they don't want to be different because then they're outside of their social group. You know, so that, that's an interesting, I think, a perspective on this toleration question, whether you could get a handle on whether or not the students that come to college actively seeking transformation, I want this college to make me different, mm. I have different answers for you on these questions of toleration of difference in classrooms. Because I think that, you know, the success story that we like to tell is the student who says, this professor rocked my world. I hated this class. I fought with this professor all semester. But 20 years later, thank God that I had it, you know? And, and then we say that's, that's what we're striving for is a transformational model. But increasingly, according to the real world of college, this student interest in transformation is a rare event and requires intention, you know, incredible intentionality. Uh, no, I think that's an excellent point. I do think also that uh, we're very closely related to what you're talking about, about transactional versus transformational. I think a lot of students are just looking at it as essentially vocational training. So I'm going to college. I mean, of course, we need to, we need to give students the skills to do well in the workforce. But I think some students come in and they're like, well, I want to learn engineering. I don't care about any of that liberal arts stuff, you know. And I think, but I do think that the onus is on the universities and colleges themselves because I think we need to show students like why this is valuable to them beyond just like, well, it makes me feel good because I'm transformed. But to say like, if you really want to think critically, you have to have some exposure to these different points of view, have some exposure to these liberal arts. arts. These are the kinds of skills that is going to give you in the future. So I think we need to translate that into skill as well. I mean, beyond just saying transformational, I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative or mocking what you're saying, but I mean, I think we need to sell it as like, I mean, and I don't mean just sell it, that's something that's not real, it is real. Like, these are the actual job skills that is going to give you to, to be, have an appreciation of history, to have an appreciation of different points of view, to understand the scientific method, et cetera. But that's good, good points, thank you. Great. Thank you. President Irvin? Gave me away. <laughs> um, I was struggling when we were voting earlier. I was struggling with the word offensive. If, if a faculty member says something offensive and then we were to, to vote accordingly, I wouldn't have struggled as much had I heard you say what you said here at the end with Michael about establishing relationships with classmates, establishing relationships with uh, in person with people who are think differently from you, and then avoiding ad hominem attacks. Um, but when I hear offensive as a former teacher, um, my thinking is if, if I'm offensive toward a student, I say something that they find spiritually, personally offensive as opposed to intellectually challenging, um, I'm voting differently. Mm. And, and I set that up to say, how does this 
work that you're doing, how does it work across a, an institution where you have a 12 to one ratio versus a seminar with 150 students? Hmm. How, how do you see those differences playing out in the kind of data that you're gathering? I always say that we can have growth uh, because we have the, a relationship between rigor and the relationship. Hmm. How do you get intellectual growth where students are okay with hearing things that could be controversial when they're one of 150? Yeah, no, I, so I think that's an excellent point. I mean, so you're saying that it's easier to have these conversations with a smaller group than it is with a large group, and I agree with you. Um, but I do, I think that that just points to the the need to emphasize the importance of this for students, the importance for critical thinking, advancing scientific knowledge, and just, um, and I do think that's why uh, why we need to have this at orientation or have some kind of class on it, just because. Um, students, uh, I mean, if we start drawing the line on saying like, well, this is offensive, this is not offensive, then my line might be different than your line. And so, so I mean, I think we have to default to saying like, as long as we're not harassing people, as long as we're not threatening people, um, I mean, you, you know, I mean, there's, there's speech that's not protected by the First Amendment, that kind of speech. Um, but I think, you know, we have to just kind of go all in and say like, you know, Anything that is not harassment or threatening other people, we allow that, and and then just teach students the value of like you know why is this important. So I mean, I I was reading it's I had a really good example where there were um, in the in the 90s I believe it was there were two African American lawyers that represented the Ku Klux Klan members in two different cases. And you know why were they representing them? Not because they agreed with. Obviously, they didn't, they were being threatened themselves. I mean that. So I mean, threatened. I said I agree. Threatened should not be protected. But they but they defended them in court. Um, and they were the reason they did is they said that I understand how important free speech is, and that I rely on free speech. And if I am not willing to defend them in this case, then you know then the protections that I have are gone. And so. I, that's maybe it's way beyond maybe what you asked me, but I, I do th I think you you raise a legitimate point. It's much more challenging, but I don't think it's because it's more challenging at a big institution doesn't mean we shouldn't try to achieve it. And and actually some of the worst places, I, I mean I'm guessing that Harvard's classes are pretty small. Um, so if you look at if you go to Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, go to their website, they rank over 400 institutions nationwide in terms of their free speech climate, okay, and it ranges, the score ranges between zero and 100. Harvard scored negative, they rounded them up to zero. Um, so they are the worst in the, in the US and they're at a, a small institution. So, um, but I mean, those are excellent points you're, you're making, thank you. And the point you made about online uh, and the cautions around that are helpful. It was interesting when we first started going in that direction, we found from uh, female students, a lot of them felt safer online, at least to, to raise their hand, right, to participate. But I, I appreciate your caution around that too, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, thanks. Great, please, Bree. And while, while you're coming, I'll just uh, direct you to a talk from last year with uh, Nadine Strauss, the former president of ACLU, who spoke on some very similar topics, and she's also a fellow at FIRE, or she is a fellow at FIRE, so please. Similarly, I, I, I'm a lawyer, so I had a hard time with the word offensive. What do you mean by offensive? Controversial, I feel different about, but um, that's not my question. So um, Michael and I serve on a, a regional group on human flourishing, and he may have already asked you this question offline. No, he hasn't, okay. So since you teach a class on human flourishing, um, I'm interested in knowing how you define it, and do you de define it from an individual perspective or a regional or community broader? Kind of perspective I, I would say both <laughs> so I mean but I, I think uh, I mean human flourishing I think it's it's not just income levels it's not just material things so it's like all aspects of your life are are you doing well in all aspects of your life I mean so so I think that um, you know things like uh, you know morality play have a role to play I mean so I don't know if you've seen Tyler Vanderweels um, his, I like the way that he defines human flourishing because he includes a, a lot of other elements of your life beyond just material things. And I, I, and I would say that I agree with 
the way that the way he defines it in that okay. way. So. Yeah, we've had we have his research and have, are speaking with him about it as well. So if you're consistent with him, then that makes sense to me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Yep. Thanks. Well, John, this has been so rich, and the, the report itself is easy to find, um, right? You can find it on, uh, I think, the Chali website, and it's freely available in PDF form. It's elegantly laid out, in fact, uh, with lots of great graphs, so I encourage everyone to go track that down. And uh, John, all the best to you at NDSU, and thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks again for having me, and I, I will just put in, I, can I put in a plug? I forgot. I, so I just want to do say, just too. check yeah. out our website, too, because there are other events if you're interested in just... Yeah. You know, hearing about stuff like, I mean, not not uh, free speech, but just other, I mean, some are free speech, but other things, just please uh, come to our website and check it out. We, For example, and we have somebody who, um, there's a movie called Undivided. We have a screening of that movie on February 15th at 7 p.m., and it deals specifically with the idea that people on both sides of the political aisle think they can't talk to other people, and so... It's, I think it's going to be really fun, and uh, so anyway, so well, sorry and let me about do that. my responsibilities as director of a center as well, and say that our <laughs> our yeah. next event is on the screen behind me, March 11th, with Patrick Tucson, who is the president of Lutheran Social Services of Minnesota. Uh, they're doing incredible work right now, innovating in the nonprofit space, and so I encourage all of you to, you know, uh, go to the Lawrence and Center website, uh, lawrenceandcenter.com, or else you can use the um, QR code there to register. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah. Great questions.